So next Sunday, I've got the privilege of leading a short-term mission trip to one of our mission partners in Cambodia. In partnership with one of our global mission partners, the Southeast Asia Prayer Center, there's a team of nine of us from various Northway locations that are gonna be heading out next week. And so I wanted to encourage you to be praying for us. Be praying for us this week as we get ready. Be praying for us as we leave next Sunday. We're leaving at about 2.30 in the morning to get to the airport. We're gonna try to arrive there. So if anybody wants to come and see us off, (laughs) we'll be over the airport at about 2.30 in the morning on Sunday. I don't see any takers. There's no hands in the air. So, well, you can at least pray for us then, okay? So we're going to be heading out. What we do when we go on these trips is we connect with the children's homes that they oversee. So we'll be heading to the towns of Kampong Tom, Siem Reap, and Bente Minche to love and encourage our mission partners over there. So please be in prayer for us as we, as we prepare and as we get ready to go. And then while we're there over those 11 days as well. But I want to ask you if you would pray with me even right now for this trip. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege of getting to partner with you. And, and as we go, we, we're doing what you're commanding us to do, to go, to make disciples, to care for people. And as we go, we pray that you would bless this team and you would bless this trip and bless us in a way that we have been already talking about in these Beatitudes, that we would experience blessing in a new way, in maybe an upside down or an inside out way, a way that we're not expecting. Help us to see you in a new way. Help us to see our brothers and sisters in Christ in new ways. Help our faith to grow as we go and follow after you. Lord, bless this trip. Bless our time as we prepare. Bless our time as we travel. And bless our time as we interact and build relationships with the beautiful people of Cambodia. Thank you for this privilege. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray, amen. Still no takers? 2.30, it's not that, okay, all right. Well, one of the things I wanted to do before I headed out on this trip was I I went to the optometrist. I needed to get new glasses and I I needed it because I knew my prescription had changed. I could tell that my glasses weren't really kind of dialed into where they need to be. And I've I've had glasses or some form of corrective lenses since I was a a little kid. I was like elementary age. And ever since I was in elementary school and up until probably like my mid thirties, my glasses always had to get stronger and stronger and stronger because my eyes were constantly changing. But then something happened about eight years ago that kind of threw me off and it made me a little bit worried. I was noticing that when I was trying to read things, I was having a hard time reading and I thought really, like I already have glasses. Now I'm in my mid thirties. Now I need to have bifocals too. I thought thirties, I'm not that old. Why is this happening? I couldn't, it wasn't that things were blurry. Just the best way I could describe it is things were intense when I was trying to look at them. And so I went to the eye doctor and he did those tests. If you've ever done it before, you put that big thing in front of your face and they switch the lenses and they ask you, is it one or two, two or three back and forth and kind of got the, the lenses dialed in. And then he came out and he gave me the news. He said, your prescription has changed. It's too strong. And I said, well, what does that mean? He said, your eyes are getting better. And I was like, can that even happen? And he said, yeah, it, it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. And And every time I've gone back to the eye doctor since then, my eyes have gotten better and better and better. And oftentimes I don't even need to wear my glasses now. I wear them to drive. I wear them so I can see all of your beautiful faces, but I don't really even need to wear my glasses that often. But the the key is, is like you gotta have the right lens that's kind of dialed in for me to be able to see what I can see. And I'm sure that some of you are like that as you're wearing glasses here today too. You know, the value of having the right lens on something. And I, I think that when we, we go through the Sermon on the Mount, what makes it so interesting is that's what Jesus is trying to do. He's trying to fit our eyes with the right lens so we can see the world the way he wants us to see it. So we can see each other the way he wants us to see each other. So we can see ourselves the way that he sees us. Having the right lens on things, it really matters with the way that we see things. And if you think about what he does through the Sermon on the Mount, he really does challenge the way that we see things. Here in the Beatitudes, this front section of the Sermon on the Mount, he's challenging how we see blessing because the way he describes it is not often the way that we tend to see blessing in the world. Later in the Sermon on the Mount, he's gonna go on and challenge how we see anger and he's gonna tie it into murder and how we value other people. He's gonna challenge the way we think about marriage and sexuality and lust. He's gonna challenge the way we see forgiveness and grace He's gonna challenge the way that we look at at generosity in our own lives. He's gonna challenge the way that we see prayer and how we can communicate and connect with him. And so a lot of what Jesus is trying to do in the Sermon on the Mount is to help us have the right lens to see the world around us and see how things are meant to be. 
And the beatitude that we're in today, it's, it is a challenging one because it's, it's challenging the way that we see God himself. So this is where we've been so far. This is Matthew 5, starting in verse 3. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That's a big blessing there, that last one. He says, if, if somehow we, you and I, are able to have pure hearts, then we have the ability to see God. And I'm gonna be honest with you, this one feels off to me. Like when I sat down and I began to read and began to prepare for this sermon, I've read this so many times in my life, but as I sat with this one, I thought, this doesn't, it, it doesn't feel like it lines up well with me. And here's why, and I think you know why, maybe you're feeling it now too, because you know that in the scriptures, there are other places that say we can't see God. In fact, they would even take it so far as to say you can't see God, and if you happen to see God, bad things will happen. You'll be destroyed. We see that in a lot of different places in the scriptures, but that, that idea of, of seeing God and not being able to handle his presence, it comes from another kind of mountaintop conversation that God has. And I think that, that this one, it kind of opens up this idea of what it looks like to see God. It opens up the idea of what Jesus is talking about and the Beatitudes. So what I want us to do is I wanna jump over to Exodus. And I wanna talk about this conversation that Moses and God have together on Mount Sinai. So if, if you need a little context, this is kind of what's happening. God has rescued Israel out of Egypt. They have seen all the plagues that rescued them. They have seen miraculous things happening. They've, they've seen the pillar of fire and the pillar of smoke leading them through the wilderness. And now they're at the base of Mount Sinai. Moses and God are up on the top and they're having a conversation. Down below, Israel is still in rebellion. They're still struggling and they wanna know who rescued us out of Egypt. They want a God that they can see a God that they can touch. And so they create for themselves a God out of a golden calf. They create an idol, one that they can see and they proclaim this is the God who rescued us out of Egypt. Meanwhile, Moses is on the mountain with God and God is telling Moses, Moses, what I want you to do is I still love and care for this people. I want you to lead them to the land that I have promised for them. And you can imagine Moses' apprehension because he's, he's looking down there. He's seeing everything that they're doing. And he's thinking, there's no way they're gonna follow me. There's no way that they're gonna follow what you're giving me to do because they are, they're stubborn. God himself in the account, he even says that they are a stiff-necked people. That's how he describes them. They're hard in their heart. They're not listening, they're, they're rebelling. And so Moses, he's got some, I think, fairly good logic. He says, God, well, if we could... If we could see you, like that's what they're craving. If we could just see you, then maybe they would follow after you. And this is what God tells him. He says, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. So on one hand, you have Jesus telling us that if we have a pure heart, we can see God. And on the other hand, here in the Old Testament, you have this conversation with Moses and God and God says, you cannot see me and live. Why can't we see him and live? Well, because God is holy. He's perfect. He's so majestic. There's so much splendor that surrounds him that sin cannot be in his presence. In fact, earlier in the story with Moses and God, God tells Moses, I can't get too close to Israel because I will consume them. If I get too close, I will consume them. Why? Because he's holy, because he's other, because he's so much bigger, sin cannot be in his presence. If God were to show up right now in front of you and I, and to show his full glory and his full presence without the saving grace of Jesus, we would be destroyed. Because sin is so woven into who we are. It's so woven into the human condition that we would not be able to survive it. But then here's where this question of can we see God or not gets even more confusing because it's one thing to have Jesus say it 1,500 years after Moses had this conversation with God, but it's another to have even in the same conversation kind of a, well, let me just read this to you. 
This is what it says about Moses and God. It says, the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. This is just a few verses before God says, you can't see my face and live. So, so can we see God or not? Well, it's kind of yes and no. And that's not like a, a cop out kind of middle ground. That's, that's kind of the answer. Can we see God or not? The answer is yes or no. And I think that there's a little bit of revealing that happens in this conversation with Moses and God. And this is where I wanna kind of open it up a little bit to help us understand what Jesus is talking about in the Beatitude. So if you'll notice, Moses asks God to show him that he can see him in two particular ways. Here's the first one. It says, now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, this is Moses talking to God. If I found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider too that this nation, these are your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. So God's saying, I will be with you. Moses says, God, I wanna see you. I wanna, I wanna know your ways. And if you think about it, knowing the ways of a person is how you really get to know who they are and really see who they are. If all you know about a person is the way that they physically look, that's a very shallow understanding of who that person is. The way that we actually get to see a person is we, we get to know how they think. We get to know how they speak about others, how they treat others, how they maybe encourage us. If you think about it, how do you form friendships? You tend to gravitate towards people based on the, the things that you can't see. Are they people of integrity? Can you trust them? Do they encourage you? Are they there when you need them? Those are all things that we can't see, but that's what really reveals who a person is. That's how you really see who a person is. So when Moses says, God, I wanna see your ways, he's saying, I don't, I don't wanna just physically see you. I wanna see who you really are. So show me your ways. And deep down, that's what we know. We know that seeing the ways of somebody is the, is the best measurement of who they really are. And I think that's why the Sermon on the Mount is so powerful and it's become so famous over the years because it is Jesus laying out his ways in front of everybody. He's proclaiming, this is the way of the kingdom of God. This is the way that I'm leading you. And the most powerful thing about Jesus that we see, not just in the Sermon on the Mount, but then the gospels themselves, is that Jesus is not a God who just stands in place, who just stands up in heaven and he says, that's the way, you guys go that way. No, he, he became flesh and blood and he walked among us and he led the way. He said, I am the way, follow me. He doesn't just point us and say, you guys need to go that way. He says, no, you follow me. I'm gonna go there first. I'm gonna lead you, so follow after me. That's what's so powerful about the gospels is that we get to see the ways of Jesus and we really get to know who he is. That's way more valuable than seeing him with our eyes. So seeing the ways of God is one of the ways that, that Moses asks to see him. The second one is this. He says, please show me your glory. Show me your glory. Now, when you think of that word glory, what comes to mind? Like there's, there's a couple things that maybe come to mind. I think if we think on an earthly level, you might even think of like the upcoming Olympics, right? Like somebody has worked really hard. They've trained for years to go out and to be the best in their field. And they, they get there, they do it. They, they run the race, they play whatever it is. And they earn the spot on the podium. They get that gold medal put around them. And they get to stand there in their glory because of their achievements, because they are the best at whatever they've done. And that is a version of glory for sure. Or maybe sometimes we think about glory as kind of like a, a, a characterization of heaven where it's, it's a bearded guy on a throne in the clouds and a bunch of baby angels with diapers and harps playing and lots of light and power. And you know, kind of this, persona, or this cartoon version of glory, right? But the reality is this heavenly glory is something different. God's glory that we see in the scriptures, it's, it all surrounds around power and sovereignty and might and majesty. And it's all these things that make God great. When we say that God is glorious, that's what we mean. It is the greatness of God. In fact, the word glory, it means weight. It means abundance. God has the most of those things. Under that umbrella of glory, he's got the most love. He's got the most mercy. He's got the most compassion. He's got the most generosity out of any entity that has ever existed or ever will exist. That's what makes him glorious. And when we think of glory, we think of God's greatness. But I, I think that we stop there. 
Like there's this weird kind of line, even in my mind sometimes, about what glory is. I think glory is what makes God so great. But if we stop there, we miss out on something. I want you to hear how God responds to Moses and how he sees his glory. Listen to what God says. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. So did you catch the difference? Like we, we think of God's glory as his greatness. And when, when Moses says, can I see your glory? God says, I will show you my goodness. And you might think, well, like what's the difference between greatness and goodness? Well, I think that if greatness is up here and it's all those things that we, we know about God, but they're kind of hard to wrap our mind around. It's hard to wrap our mind around the holiness of God. It's hard to wrap our mind around the sovereignty of God, how he is all knowing and he's all present. That, those are things we can trust and understand, but we can't really wrap our minds around them fully. But I think the goodness of God, that's kind of on our level. That, that's down here. That's in life. That's in the trenches. That's in the joys and the pains of our everyday existence. The goodness of God is the way that God reveals himself here and now in our individual details, in our individual lives. I've seen the goodness of God be expressed in people in a lot of different ways. I've, I have sat with families who are waiting on the results of a scan. And when the news came back that the scan gave good news, they praised God. That's the goodness of God. But I'll tell you, I have also sat on the other end of that with a family who was waiting on a scan and the news was not great. And yet they found the goodness of God in the friends and the family who were caring for them and praying for them. I've seen the goodness of God in, in someone who gets the achievements at work and they get elevated, they get a new title, they get new responsibility, they get more income and they praise the goodness of God in that moment. But I have also seen the goodness of God when someone was passed over for a promotion that they wanted and somewhere down the road, they realized that would have not been a great decision because while that would have been a great thing for my bank account, that would have been a terrible thing for my kids. And so I see the goodness of God in that thing, the goodness in God in, in his decision to withhold that from me. And the reality is, is that's how the goodness of God tends to kind of show up in our lives. It, it's only after time that we really get to see it and experience it. it. It's not often that we get to see it in the moment. Sometimes it takes looking backwards to see what's really going on and, and to have the right lens to understand what God has been doing in our lives. Listen how this conversation between Moses and God wraps up. This is verse 20, it says, but he said, you shall not see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by you, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back but my face shall not be seen. So there's a, lot of, there's a lot of personification going on in this passage. It's talking about God's face and God's hand and God's back. Those aren't physical descriptions. That's just a way for us to understand what's happening here. But what's really interesting is, is when God says, I will show you my back, that word back, when it's most often used in the Old Testament, it has nothing to do with your physical back. It has to do with time. It's like if I were telling you a story and I said, hey, back last Tuesday, back on Tuesday, this is what happened to me. Kind of using it as a reference of time. In other words, what God is telling Moses is, Moses, you can't handle what I'm doing right now. You can't see it. You wouldn't survive it. But I can show you, if you look back, I can show you where I've been. And when I came to realize that in that passage, I, I, I was a bit convicted because I realized like I don't do that often enough to look back to see where God has been good in my life. I had this happen just last year where I, I took a kind of a trip all on my own. There's a farm down in West Virginia that's been in our family for generations. I've talked about it up here before. When I was a kid, it was my grandfather's farm. And I spent a lot of time there as a kid. The way that the farm is kind of laid out is on one side of this main road who go, goes through this area, there's 20 acres on one side. That's where the house is. That's where the barns are and the garages. On the other side are hundreds of acres where as a kid, I could just go 
and explore and run around. And a lot of it is woods. And so I would just spend time out in the woods and I would just go and I would run around with friends or sometimes by myself. And I haven't been there in probably 20 some years, but last year I decided I'm gonna drive down there and I'm just gonna go take a walk in the woods that I spent so much time in as a kid. And when I was a kid, I didn't know anything about God. We didn't talk about him in our house. But, but during this walk, something was completely different, which is now I'm a follower of Jesus. And I, and I just took this walk out in the woods and I was about an hour into my walk and I just got overwhelmed with the goodness of God in these woods. Because I, I realized like how much he was speaking to me back then, preparing my heart for accepting him when I was older. The reason why I spent so much time in those woods was because home was just chaotic when I was a kid. And so these woods, they were an escape for me. They were a way to go away and, and have a, a quiet place and to process what was going on. And I look back now and I think God was so good to give me the gift of just these, these trees, this place in creation, where if you would go on a walk in that same place, you would never experience it. But I look back and I, I can see the goodness of God right there. And I just think I don't do that enough to look back and to see the goodness of God in my life. When was the last time that you did that? that you just took some intentional time to go back over the events of your life, whether it's just over the last week or over the last several years and identify the places that God has been good in your life and to thank him and to praise him for his goodness, for being in the details down here on the ground with us. That's how we get to see the goodness of God. So if the goodness of God and the, the glory and the ways of God is how we really see him, what is that kind of lens to see those things? Well, Jesus says that it's a pure heart. In that beatitude, he says that it's a pure heart. Now, purity is not perfection. So don't, don't mishear that. And it's, not, it's often equated in the Bible with blamelessness. It's not sinlessness. It's just the idea that you are free from impurities. And for the follower of Christ, it's that Jesus has secured that freedom for us that we can be free from impurities, not out of our own works of what we've done, but because he has offered this through his life, his death, and his resurrection from the cross. And so purity is a, a freedom that we have, but just because we have that freedom, it doesn't always mean that we take that freedom. There's so many warnings in the scriptures about not allowing impurities to get into our life and to cloud our vision so that we can't see God. There's all kinds of lists in there of things like sexual immorality, and greed and selfishness and lying that are listed in the scriptures, not so that we can see those and just try harder, but so that we can live in that freedom that Jesus has already secured for us and avoid those things so that we can see him clearly. And I think so many people struggle and they'll say, well, I can't really see God working in my life, but it's because we've allowed so many of those impurities to be in our life, unchecked. Jesus says, in order to see God, you need to have a pure heart. And those kind of things, they come up, they rise up out of our hearts. This, this is what makes one of the most common kind of slogans of our day so dangerous. I know you've heard this one before. It goes like this, follow your heart. And you might kind of roll your eyes and be like, well, that's just a saying. It's something you see on Instagram or Pinterest, like a cute little thing people might print off and hashtag, right? But the reality is, is that a lot of us live by this motto, even though we may not say it out loud follow your heart. And what we're really saying when we say that phrase is the best lens by which to, to see this world and to move through this world is the lens of my desires. What do I want? How will this serve me? Or maybe it's the lens of your own logic. What makes the most sense to me? Or maybe it's the lens of your own emotions. What feels right to me? That's what it looks like to follow after our hearts, and it's a dangerous way to live. It's a dangerous way to live because our hearts are not reliable. There's a, a pastor and an author I follow online, and he said it this week, he said this quote, he said, follow your heart has ended more marriages, mutilated more bodies, destroyed more souls, and ended more lives than the devil could ever have, have imagined. It's hell's most effective slogan yet. Why is it so dangerous to follow your heart? Well, I want you to hear how God describes your heart and my heart. Listen to what he says in Jeremiah through the prophet. He says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. 
Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Our hearts are deceitful and they're sick in their natural state of sin. Listen, how Jesus talks about the heart. Later on in Matthew, after the Sermon on the Mount, he says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts and murder and adultery and sexual immorality, theft and false witness and slander. And maybe that feels offensive to you to like hear God describe your heart that way. But just remember that it's, our hearts are not this way because of him. It's because of sin. He's trying everything he can to rescue us away from that. Our hearts are deceitful because of us. So just imagine this. I, I've been a pastor at Northway for many, many years. I've gotten the privilege of getting to sit down and counsel a lot of people and give some guidance. People will come, they'll ask their pastoral team for some guidance on an issue or whatever they're struggling with. And there are just sometimes when I'm sitting with somebody that I begin to realize I don't have the ability to counsel them in the way that they need counseled. And I'm so thankful that we have a counseling center here who can help take them to another level. But there's just sometimes I realize I, I don't have the ability to do it. So could you imagine you come to me, you're, you're dealing with something and you come to me and I say, you know what? I don't really know where to go with this, but I have a counselor for you who I, I wanna recommend. And they, and they, they give out a lots of advice to numerous people. They're, they're constantly meeting with people and encouraging them and giving them guidance. And as I give you the card and encouraging you to call them, I say, but I gotta warn you, they're pretty deceitful and they're kind of sick in the head. <laughs> and sometimes, only sometimes, they murder people. <laughs> they lean towards evil. They have a lot of sexual lust, a lot of evil thoughts, a lot of greed, and they lie. Are you making that phone call? No, you're not making that phone call. But that's what it's like to follow your heart. That's the way that God describes our hearts. And so when we, when we go after this idea of just follow your heart, follow what you feel inside, it's such a dangerous way to live because our hearts are not trustworthy. When we follow our hearts, it will always lead us from, from good habits to bad habits. Our hearts will always lead us from spending time wisely to spending time poorly. Our hearts, our hearts will always lead us in that direction because they're impulsive. They don't think of the long game. They're always just thinking of themselves. They're nearsighted. And if this beatitude shows us anything, it's that our hearts are not meant to be followed. They're meant to be purified. So how does it happen? Do we just try harder to be better people? No, that's not what the scriptures teach at all. We can't purify our own hearts. Only God can do that. Listen to what he says in the Proverbs. He says, the crucible is for silver and the furnace for gold and the Lord tests the hearts. He gives this image of a crucible, of a furnace, of heating up metal to where the impurities rise to the top so they can be removed. He says, that's what I do for your hearts. I set them on fire so that the impurities can rise to the top and I can remove them. And when you look in his word, he talks about this fire, this idea of purifying your hearts in two ways. The first is by the fire of his word. By the fire of his word, David writes this in the Psalms. He says, the words of the, the, the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace and on the ground, purified seven times. His word is able to purify us because it is pure. It is the essence of purity. It is the most pure thing. There's nothing else like his word in all of existence. And some may say, well, this is just a book put together by men over the years, but they clearly, people who have said that have never truly interacted with this book, have never truly interacted with this library, this collection of historical accounts and poetry and revelation. God has woven into his word the ability to change us, to, to, to change our hearts, to purify us. If we really open up his word and open up our hearts to his word, there's a lot of conviction that comes. There's a lot of conviction that comes. There's a lot of challenges to see things different, to see our life differently, to see each other differently, to see ourselves differently, to see God differently. In this book, it, it reveals our sin. It convicts those desires, those things that our hearts want to chase after. It gives us a steady line to go after instead of a fickle heart. And it opens up our spiritual eyes when we open up our hearts to the word. That's how he purifies us through his word. 
The author of Hebrews talks about it as a surgeon. It's able to cut to the deepest parts of who we are. The parts that you don't even know about yourself, the word of God can get in there and, and find the illness and pull out the impurities if you allow it. And for those of you who are here today, maybe you're, you're kind of thinking along those lines of like, well, I just don't know what to think of this book because I've heard that many times before and I do kind of think that maybe it was just put together by a group of men. I just want, I want to give you a challenge. Like if you kind of find yourself in that category of like, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, or maybe even you're in that category of like, I'm agnostic. I don't really know what to believe. If you are here, I'm so thankful that you are. I'm just thankful that you trusted us enough to come here and hear this today. But I just want to give you a challenge. Take something from the word of God. Maybe take something that is uncomfortable to you and try it on. Like, and if you don't know where to start, let me give you a suggestion. Let's fast forward into the Sermon on the Mount a little bit more. Jesus says something radical. He says, love your enemies and pray for them. Try that one on and see if your heart changes. Because I'll tell you this, that if you truly identify somebody as an enemy and you begin to love them, like really love them, they can't hold on to that title for very long. It changes you. Something changes inside of you when you obey the word of God. So that's my challenge. Try it. Try it on. And if you are here today and you are a follower of Christ and you said yes to him at some point in your life and you see this as the word of God, let me give you a challenge too, to not miss something. The late British author Leonard Ravenhill said this, there is a world of difference between knowing the word of God and knowing the God of the word. See, the goal is not just to have more information in our head, it's to have transformation of our hearts, to open our hearts to, to his word, to let him change us. And so even if you're a follower of Christ, don't allow just a bunch of information to get in your head. This has got to transform your heart so that you look more and more like Jesus every day. That's the difference. So purified by the fire of his word. And then the second is purified by the fire of his Holy Spirit. The spirit, it brings conviction into our lives. Listen how John the Baptist began to talk about Jesus early in the gospels. He says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. When you see the Spirit of God in the scriptures, it's often connected to fire. You think of the pillar of fire that led Israel to the base of that mountain at Mount Sinai. Think of on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came down. It says that it looked like flames of fire, tongues of fire that came down on them. When Jesus has a post-resurrection interaction with some disciples on the road to a town called Emmaus, they finally realize who he was. What do they say? Our hearts were burning inside of us the whole time he was talking to us. When Paul later on goes to talk about the Holy Spirit and cautioning us to make sure that we're obeying it and we're not disregarding it, what does he say? He says, don't quench the Holy Spirit like a fire. The Holy Spirit is like a fire inside of us because what Jesus says in John 16 is he brings conviction into our life. He points out the impurities in our hearts, not through guilt, but through conviction because he wants our hearts to be pure. And so he will point out the impurities that are causing us to not be able to see God and convict us of those things. And how does he do it? Well, the best way I can say it is like the word of God and the spirit of God, they work together. They're not separate entities. Why? Because it is his word. The Holy Spirit is never gonna tell you to do something that goes against God's word. They work together in a, in a kind of a refining process. The best way I could think about this, this is gonna be so silly, but the best way I could think about this was a, a photo that I have of my boys. We went on vacation years ago and we went to a place where they had some bikes that you could take out for the day and ride. And of course, my boys zeroed right in on this one. Check this out. Right? Okay, so there's my two older boys, Josiah in the front, Samuel in the back, and they got on a tandem bike and they're trying to ride together. I don't know if you've ever tried to ride one of these. They're a lot harder than you think that they are. And so I thought, well, I don't wanna just show a photo. I'm gonna go ahead and show you what it looked like on their first attempt to go ahead and ride this thing. So check this out.
Oh, yeah, legend has they're still riding to this day. I haven't seen them. <laughs> they rode off into the sunset and they couldn't stop. So hopefully someday they'll make it home. Last I heard, they were somewhere in Idaho. <laughs> But when you think of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, that's it. They're in sync. They're always in sync, minus the awkwardness. They're always in sync with each other. They're never going to get out of sync. The Holy Spirit is never going to tell you to do something that the Word of God tells you not to do. They work in sync with each other. And when the Word of God gets into our hearts and there's more Spirit activating inside of us, then that's what it looks like to have purified hearts, to have hearts that are more and more pure and the ability to see God's kingdom and to see God's ways more and more and more. This is what Paul calls in the Old Testament, having the eyes of your heart opened. Listen to what he says to the letter to the Ephesians. He says, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. He's thanking God because this has happened. He says that you may know what it is to hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe? according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Paul says, this is what it looks like to have your eyes opened. This is what it looks like to see God. When your eyes are open, you can see more hope around you. Don't you wanna see more hope around you? There's a lot of hopelessness that gets communicated in our world. I wanna see more hope. I want my eyes to be more opened. And so I wanna remove the impurities that caused me to just drift towards those hopeless stories that we hear. He says, I wanna see more of his riches. I wanna see that too. I wanna see the richness of Christ in my life. He says, you can see more of his immeasurable greatness. I wanna see his greatness. I wanna see his goodness. I wanna see his power. Those are the things that I wanna focus on. And Jesus says, if we are willing to open up our hearts to allow his word and his spirits to purify us, that's how we get to see him to see his ways, to see his glory, to see his goodness in our lives. That's what it means to be able to see God here on this side of eternity. And one day we will get to see him face to face for all eternity, but for now, we have the opportunity to see him here. And what a privilege that is, that he has revealed and opened up little pieces of heaven for us to be able to see here and now. I think that's what Jesus is talking about in this beatitude when he says, blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are those who are willing to open their hearts to be purified by me because they will see me. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the cross, the sacrifice that made all of this possible. We would be living in darkness without you. I think of 2 Corinthians 4 when it says the God of this world has blinded the eyes of unbelievers. We thank you and praise you for those of us whose eyes have been opened. We pray for our families and our friends, our coworkers who still live in that darkness and still live in that blindness, that their eyes would be opened, maybe because of the way that we operate and we see the goodness of you around us and we communicate it to them. We're so thankful that you give us the opportunity to be able to see you and see your ways and see your goodness in our life. We can never express that thanks enough. So Jesus, we do thank you. We love you. We praise you. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.